sections 10, 2, and 10, 4 together, we're going to call heat, transfer, and control. So we're looking at heat and defining it. We're going to talk about heat transfer itself and thermal equilibrium. And then we're going to talk about how you control heat and the applications and the modes of heat transfer. So to start, we need to define these nice and loud for us. So, for example, if I were to put my hand on this part of the table right here, my hand is definitely warmer than the tabletop. The heat is leaving my hand and moving into the table because there's a temperature difference. Now, at the same time this is happening, the heat is actually propagating toward light. It's coming at you through the table. It's heat going in that direction. It's going outward everywhere because my hand is hotter than the table. So now that spot on the table is hotter than the rest of the table. So that heat is then transferring to the rest of the table. So this is a solid. This is analogous in nature to the idea of potential energy. Think about gravitational potential energy. What do you always want to do? Get to a state of equilibrium, ground level. That's what's happening with heat, the same exact thing there. Let's take a look at this on a more, or on a microscopic level. So here's what we've got. We've got a can of soda. Easy example to use again, right? In an ice water bath, the can of soda or juice in this case is 45 degrees Celsius. The water ice bath is 5 degrees Celsius. And as yesterday, I think Mike, it was you, right, that made this suspicion that it would be in between? Yeah. Yeah. We know that the resulting equilibrium temperature is somewhere in between. But let's describe now what's physically happening. So here's what's happening. The can is hotter than the water. Heat will move from high temperature to low temperature. Energy always transfers from high temperature to low temperature. So these molecules are moving fast. These are the juice molecules right here. Then there's this metal lining whose temperature may be at like the same temperature as the water by this point because it's now touching it. So these molecules are pretty close to standing still. And the water molecules are moving very slowly because they are at a low temperature. Now, over time, these vibrations cause molecular vibrations here, which cause molecular vibrations here, what will happen is these vibrations slow down and these vibrations speed up until they're all at the same vibrational level. Okay? So these molecules are moving very quickly now compared to the way they were moving before because the water went from being 5 degrees Celsius to 11 degrees Celsius. But the juice, it went from moving really fast to moving relatively slow compared to what it was moving at. This is a state of equilibrium. Earlier, the direction of energy transfer was out of the can. That's why these two arrows are showing out of the can. But now, when there's equilibrium, energy is transferring from the water to the can and the can to the water at the exact same rate. Well, if there's energy moving in both directions at the same rate, the net is zero. Just like this, ready? I pushed out of the table. Why isn't the table moving? With what force? Exactly, it's normal force of the same force. So it's still, a, it's still in a state of equilibrium. There's no acceleration here. I'm pushing now with say five newtons, normal force pushing back up is five newtons. Five minus five is zero. Same thing as on the right side. There still is some transfer. There is, but it's at the same rate. It's like osmosis. You know in osmosis, the idea is that there's a higher density or a higher concentration of fluid on one side and a low concentration on the other side of the membrane. And what happens? The membrane is porous, so it's able to transfer that other fluid. And eventually, both concentrations start to what? High concentration outside the membrane, low inside. Yeah, they balance out or they get to a state of equilibrium. Equilibrium. Okay? All right, cool. The idea makes sense what's happening? So which way does heat travel always? From high temperature to... Low temperature. High temperature to low temperature. Okay, just like high gravitational energy, and then I jump off the table and I have low gravitational energy. Okay, high gravitational energy to low gravitational energy, always. Same thing goes with your electric potential, okay, in a field. The same thing with electric potential. All right, let's take a look at some units now. The units you know right away are the first one, joules, okay? Let's see. <laughs> Can we crack a window? 
some airflow. I don't know if that's going to help or not. Is that going to make it worse with allergies? Yeah. Is the way those open makes it worse in it? I mean, like the. But there's just so many plants in the room right now. That's what you should say. Maybe it's like leave that Maybe it'll just flow out, right? Yeah. Or hopefully. I don't know. Anyway, all right, so we know joules, okay? We know joules already. Those are our standard unit. What do you see all the time when it comes to nutrition? Calories. Yeah, and you don't see the second one, though, believe it or not. This is not what you see. This is what you see down here with a capital, God bless you, with a capital C. And this is equivalent to 4,186 joules, right? 4.186 times 10 to the third is 4,186 joules in one calorie of food. That shows you how small a joule is. Joules are such small units of energy. Think about this. Who likes Twinkies? Twinkies. Really? I'm trying to think of something that's kind of fattening, but really tastes good. Doritos. Dorito. They're not really that fattening, though, are they? Are they Doritos fattening? Saturated fat. Or how about just average? All right. Who likes Shake Shack? Oh, yeah. right. You get a Shake Shack burger. It's probably like 700 calories in that thing at least. Whatever, you gotta run. Exercise. So you eat this burger with 700, with 700 calories in it. How much are your calories in a Twinkie? I don't, probably like 150 for a Twinkie at least. Yeah. So 700 calories in a Shake Shack burger. You take 700 and multiply it by this quantity here. So you're looking at, let's see, almost that. If you multiply that by 100, it would be 418,000. So by 700, 2,800,000 joules of energy are in a Shake Shack burger. 2,800,000 joules of energy. But that just tells you how small, guys, as that tells you how small energy units for joules are, okay? Because you could run about five miles and burn 700 calories easily, okay? So all that same thing, you just ate that burger, run for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour, you burn the burger right off, okay? So yeah, joules, there's a lot of them in a burger, but when you exercise, you burn a lot of calories. As a result, you burn a ton of joules because there are a lot of calories, or joules in a calorie. Wait. Uh, What's up? <laughs> okay, so we are interested here and here so far. Now, a BTU is called a British Thermal Unit. If you ever buy an air conditioner, what are the ratings it has? It says how many BTUs of energy it either uses or removes from a room in a certain given period. Okay, so these are British Thermal Units. Okay, it's used a lot in engineering, air conditioning, and refrigeration. Okay, old chemistry works, okay? And physics works, used the unit of calorie. Any questions on these? Just different units, applications of them. Heat and energy tomorrow in 10.3 is going to go back to joules. We'll continue to use joules, our standard value. All right, so let's take a look now at heat and work. So the statement above says, if you do work, if you do work on an object, you're really changing its internal energy level. Give me an example of when you do work on an object that relates to heat and its inter internal energy level. We've done things this year for sure that can relate to that. Like when you're hitting with metal, like a hammer? Sure, perfect. You hammer a nail into wood, the friction that is between the metal of the nail and the wood itself is very high that does work on the object, as a result, it produces heat. If you pull that nail, that nail right out, that nail will be very hot. Try it sometime. Nail a nail it and then pry it out right away. You'll feel it, it will actually be hot. Because you're getting heat as a result of work being done. Awesome, Nick. What else? If you like erase something really fast with yeah. an eraser, and then you touch the eraser, it's kind of hot. If you erase something with an eraser real fast, very good. What about a rubber band? Ever go like this? Every Stretch it. Zipper. Stretch your rubber band over and over again. And then take the stretch part and just put it between your lips. Like it's this. like warm. It's hot. Yeah, you feel it. It actually that. generates heat. A paper clip. Bend it back and forth. It gets hot right It right gets hot right at that junction and then it'll actually split. The light bulb lab with the circuit, the bulbs themselves get hot. Because what are you doing? You're doing work to the system. As a byproduct, there is heat because you're doing work. 
So the work you do is converted to heat a lot of the time. Okay, so generally speaking, friction. Okay, remember friction here. All right? Take a look now at the three modes of heat transfer. The three modes of heat transfer. Have you heard these before? Show of hands if you've heard of one of them at least. Conduction, convection, or radiation. Okay. Now, anybody watch Bill Nye the Science Guy as a kid? Yes. Seriously? Yeah. He has episodes on all three of these. I think there's one that covers all three. And it's a really actually good episode. If we have time at the end, maybe we can watch a little. Bill Nye does the experiment with the uh, the Does he? Yeah. Does he no way, is it in that episode? It's in one of those. Okay. Remember the hand thing I told you with the hand in the water? He said Bill Nye did that in one of his episodes. I read about it in like a textbook somewhere. Yeah. I'm sure he probably thought of it before then too. Alright, so let's start by looking at conduction. These are going to take... Really important that you understand this. This is really the gist of this lesson. The three modes of heat transfer. So conduction is the example I gave earlier when I walked over to Mike's table and put my hand on the table. Yeah. I'll do it over here. So put my hand on the table. What I'm doing is I'm providing the table with heat because my hand is at a higher temperature. Now, my hand's higher temperature and the table itself are in contact. That is two, look at the definition up here. Transfer of thermal energy between two regions of matter or, or two different materials in contact due to a temperature gradient. A gradient is a slope. It just means a difference in temperature. So because my hand is at a different temperature than the table, heat will transfer through the molecules. How does this happen? So higher temperature means more kinetic energy, more motion of the molecules on an internal level in my hand. Now, those vibrations themselves will propagate to the other material, causing that material to vibrate, and as a result, its energy level, internal energy level increases, thus its temperature also increases. So over time, if you took like, say you took a, a hot plate, okay, and you put it on this desk right here, and you didn't insulate it with anything, and it was generating heat there, and it was touching the table. Around it, if you took like an infrared camera, you would see the heat signature. You would see a big red circle here, and then the different waves of color coming around it. You would see that the energy is conducting outward from the heat source. From the heat source. How is this related in computers? What in computers uses conduction to control heat? To control heat, what do you use in computers, yeah. Scott? Um, don't computers have hands? Okay, but that's not conduction, that's the next one. So hold off one sec, Scott. In the next section for convection, that's a fan. So we'll talk about that. So hold that idea. They are made of silicon, which is a good conductor. Okay. Convection, though, still, actually. It's convective because it's a fluid flow. We'll get to that. So hold those two off. Both of those are good. Don't some of them have, like, batteries with mercury? They do. The, the batteries have lithium and stuff, but there's something else different I'm thinking of. You have to know the makeup of a computer. If you ever built a computer, what do you attach to the CPU always? Rule of thumb. Something's always attached to the CPU because the CPU is the thing that produces all the heat, you know. Central processing unit. It's like a piece of the computer that gives off a lot of heat. It's not a fan, actually. Mm. Fan is different. Fan is on a separate part. What is it? Motherboard? Not a motherboard. It's called a heat sink. A heat sink. It's a piece of metal. And this is how it looks. I'll show you, okay? So the CPU is some sort of a chip that generates a lot of heat. You take something called the heat sink and you attach it to it. And it's a big piece of metal. And as a result, the contact between these two surfaces is what takes all the heat. The metal absorbs the heat, and then it's attached to what's called a heat pipe, or, or as Scotty said, a fan runs over the surface of the heat sink and cools the heat sink itself. Now, the heat pipe and the fan, we'll talk about in like two seconds. Hold off on that for a moment. What I want you to know is this. The CPU, that red chip, gives off heat, and it's in contact with the heat sink. The heat sink is made of metal. Metal is a very good conductor, generally speaking, so it's able to absorb a lot of that heat. Where it goes from there, we'll talk about with convection in a moment, okay? But that's the general idea. What is a bad conductor? As I just said, metal is a good conductor. Rubber. Rubber. Rubber is a very bad conductor. Okay, what else? It's something that's not always thought of as a bad conductor, as a really bad, like a good insulator. A bad conductor, right, is a good insulator. 
of thermal energy. Plus, like a lot of organic things, not good insulators. Dirt. I'm guessing they are organic things, um, depending on their amount of water in them. Because water is polar, so water does conduct electricity. Well, that's electricity, it's not really heat. Organic, I'm thinking. There's something that is used a lot, but not understood. Dirt. Like a down comforter, or these windows. Cotton. There's something, in, or these windows. Glass. There's no cotton in the windows. It's not glass. Wood. Fiber. Fiber. Yeah. Fiber. Why is a window, let me follow that up with a better question. Why is, that Why is a window double paned? <laughs> For the sun. Shot. I mean, it might help. Yeah, so it makes sense. Isn't that the thing with like the. Uh, the, 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 the air heat. trapped in the middle? It looks What's in the middle of it? The air trapped in the middle. There's air trapped in the middle of the double pane, usually argon gas or sometimes just air. Why? To prevent a drought. Heat. Heat the <laughs> Yeah, it acts as an insulator. So, what statement can you say about gases? Air, air is an insulator. Gases in general, air, argon, other gases, are great insulators. So, when you have like a parka in the winter, you see people in like Alaska wearing parkas. They're really fluffy, aren't they? And you wonder like, why are these things oh, puffy? Air. There's oh, air in there. Air is a great insulator. Or you better move out A down comforter. <laughs> down comforters are nice and fluffy, aren't they? Yeah. The air that's trapped in there is actually what's keeping the heat in your body. It's, it's a great insulator. <laughs> Double pane windows, glass is actually a decent conductor of yeah. thermal energy. So a lot of the energy wants to move from the inside of the room through the glass, but then it hits this air barrier or this gas barrier. Think it's argon is what's used in a lot of them. Wait, but okay. air, if there's fire, like air. It's different. That's combustion. Oh. This is, we're talking about heat oh, generating as oh. a source. Have you ever heard of spontaneous heat combustion? <laughs> I've heard that of it. Like, it's true. Okay, so please jot that down. Metal, good conductor. Any gases are good insulators. Gases are really good insulators. Let's go to convection and see what Elliot and Scotty were talking about for the computer, how that applies. Oh, actually, before that, before that, let's discuss one other thing. Materials have what are called conductivity. Write this down. Conduct, conductivity. Conductivity coefficients. Just like, remember, springs have spring stiffnesses and stuff? So they have conductivity coefficients. And it's a material property, like density or something like that. Like a material property, it's inherent. And the variable used is actually K. It's annoying because springs are K, but it'll be all right. Okay? So the K value, if I say the K value of a material, it's the conductivity. Higher K values means it's more conductive for thermal energy. So metals are higher K values. Lower K values are better insulators. Lower K values are better insulators. So those have examples like gas. Gas, the K values might be decimals. I hope I don't have to stand behind the whole period, right? All right, thank you. Lower K values, those values are like air, or as Mike said, I think rubber before, uh, Elliot mentioned, organic materials, okay? Like plant life and stuff. Dirt, plant life, things like that, yeah. Um, no, this has to do with the transfer of heat due to convection, conduction, and radiation. I mean, fire, fire uses all three, actually. When there's a fire, there's radiation, there's convection. I am. I love fires. Yeah. I just like fires. You don't like looking at, like, a fire? Snort a fire? That is, how would that even work? It's like hurting my nose thinking about this. All right, let's so convection, why is a convection oven called a convection oven? Because it moves yeah, volatile fluid to transfer the heat. Good reading of the definition, eh? Because, yeah, it's a fluid, it's a gas, it's air. Bless you. But the, the air is constantly flowing in the oven, actually. The air is moving. There's a convective current okay, so in the oven. Right so this is an example of it. What's that like? Does it like evenly cook it or like... Yeah, that's the whole idea. A convection oven wants to evenly cook the material, so you need that flow. You need that constant motion of air to create a state of equilibrium. So look at this tea kettle. The warm water molecules that are getting heated up at the bottom, what do they do? Circle. They move to the top. Remember, doesn't hot air rise in a room? Yeah. Same idea. 
The hotter the water molecules, the less dense they are. So therefore, they move to the top of the fluid. This is why density is related still. The cold molecules move to the bottom of the fluid. Okay? These are convective currents. Convection always involves fluids to think about cooling or heating. So back to your statement earlier, Scott, can you make what you said about how you would cool down a computer another way? Yeah, a fan is blowing a fluid, air, over the material. It's convection. And in, as a result, it's similar, or not as a result, but it's similar to evaporation. Evaporation usually has to do with the temperature of the surface it's sitting on. So if there's like water on a blacktop in the summer, it'll evaporate because it's hot, or because there's wind, and the wind is acting as a convective current. And Elliot, what was your explanation earlier? Liquid uh, nitrogen. How does that work? That's exactly right. It acts as what's called a double pipe heat exchanger. If you study engineering, it's one of the basic labs you study. Double pipe heat exchanger. And the idea is this. If you have a heat sink here, the CPU right here, you will run these tubes across the heat sink. And what's happening is this. Cool liquid nitrogen is flowing in right here. It absorbs a lot of the heat from the heat sink along the way. So what comes out? on the way out. Is it really cool anymore? It's a higher temperature nitrogen. But then it goes through a process, a thermodynamic process, that recools the nitrogen and goes back through the cycle. You use energy to do that, but as a result, you're dissipating the heat. It's really kind of cool to think about. It's amazing to think about, actually. Okay? Uh, a double pipe heat exchanger is if you have a hot fluid flowing in the inner pipe, but it needs to cool down like this, you put another pipe around it with cold fluid flowing over it in the opposite direction. So say this, the inner pipe is red and that's the nitrogen and you heat it up and it's flowing in this direction. You put an insulation around the nitrogen with cool water running over it so that it absorbs the heat from the nitrogen as a result. So it's like absorption of absorption. Okay, but this is usually, double pipe heat exchangers are more for things like energy, uh, like generators or, um, gosh, what are they called in the house? That, give you heat with propane? In your house, you have these in your basement. Hot water heaters. Jeez, can't think of the word. You know like a hot water heater in your basement and stuff? Yeah. Okay. The idea, the concept of a double pipe heat exchanger is used with insulation. Okay. The insulating surface wants to keep that heat in. It's the opposite of absorbing the heat there. But the theory is analogous and you can take this model and expand it to lots of applications. It's one of the more fundamental ones. The magma's motion is definitely convective currents. The, the Earth's core and stuff moves due to convective currents, which is what gives us a magnetic field, or supposedly gives it to us. Um, but does it result in earthquakes? I don't know, because that's the motion of the tectonic plates. Well, I, I guess it's probably the imbalance of pressure which is causing them to move, which pressure is related to convection. Convection is a result of pressure differential, temperature differential, one other thing I wrote down. And buoyancy. Buoyancy, right? Because clearly we see that the less dense fluid flows to the top. Pressure differential and temperature differential. Okay? Uh, the convective coefficient is called H. In the previous spot, the conductive coefficient was called K with conductivity. With convection, it's called H. It's again a material property, material property, whatever it is. Now, um, a good thing to know is this. Convection is directly related to the exposed area. For example, for example, anybody know how a radiator works? Like, you can look in the back if you want to. Look at the radiator in the back. How does a radiator work? Why is it going through pipes? Why isn't it one big block? with all the hot water in it. Why is it flowing through all these pipes? It's got the little thingy. Oh, this one. I Any of them. This one in my house. This Any is the one where it's like if the water, it heats up quicker, but it cools down slowly, right? Okay, that's fine, but how does it work? How does it give off heat, I'm saying? It's Why is the radiator in the shape it is? Water comes out of and the steam. So it's not giving so off heat, that, actually. So that's that's just balancing the pressure. My cat comes in. So that's yeah, that's when there's pressure balance in your lines. It'll bleed out. 
open space in between. Yeah, the open space in between all those pipes. Take a look at the radiator. Please look at it. See the open space in between the pipes? Now, that increases the area exposed. If I had just a block of metal with hot water in it, there's only a certain amount of surface area. But isn't there more surface area on every contour? Yeah. So traditionally, radiators are fins. They're called fins, or they're sheets of metal. And they're drawn like this. If I can do this correctly, I did a terrible illustration in the other class. Click the blocks. <laughs> So these fins are all attached to a radiator and they're coming out of the wall. So imagine a sheet of thin sheet of metal. So take sheet metal and come out of the wall. Okay, they look like little like if I went across it it would like it would make music, like a little, you know, like if you ran your fingers along this, it would like vibrate. The back of an air conditioner, yeah. Think of the back of an air conditioner, those metal like those metal like plates. Push them in. Okay? You can push them in, yeah, you shouldn't. When you push them in and they make contact, you're reducing the surface area. And as a result, your air conditioner may overheat. That's, those are fins because they can give all the heat away that the air conditioner absorbed. That's why they're shaped that way. So look at these fins. There's surface area on this side and on this side. And there's surface area on this side. Now the, there's eight areas in these four fins. And they're four rectangles. They're double though because they're on both sides. So there's a lot of cross-sectional area. So we should write down the fact that more cross-sectional area or more area exposed more means heat. more convection or more heat given off. Okay, so you want to maximize the amount of fins while minimizing the amount of space occupied by that radiator. Okay, maximize the amount of fins. While minimizing the space used. That's really a goal when you're coming to drying things off. Radiation, which you really know already, but you don't realize it sometimes. Okay, so it's a process in which energetic particles or waves travel through a medium or space. Okay, so think about this. The sun, you're not really feeling convection from the sun. You're not feel, feeling conduction from the sun. When there's a breeze, you feel convection in the wind. But the sun's energy you feel is strictly radiation. Okay, and it comes in the form of photons which it then absorbs in your skin or your skin feels it as heat. So it's heating up due to radiation. Now, radiation does not involve any transfer of matter itself. Okay? Um, what happens is this. This is how it actually works. The hotter body, so say like a fire, is at a higher temperature. Evan, move your bed, please. The hotter temperature, like a fire, for example. Be careful. Sorry. You hurt your arm. The hotter temperature gives off heat due to radiation. So fire is radiating heat. It's also convecting heat because of the temperature difference and the breeze you get. And when there's combustion, you have convection occurring with it. There's also conduction if you have like held a pan over it. You heat it up like a frying pan over a fire. That's conduction also because it's conducting heat because of the two different materials. And the pan itself is conducting heat throughout itself. For radiation, though, what happens is the source wants to go to a lower energy level, just like all other things. So what it does is, is it emits some form of radiation. And as a result, when it emits radiation, it lowers its internal energy level. So the sun is constantly lowering its internal energy level, although we know that it's a chain reaction of, you know, like a, a hydrogen bomb occurring so over and over again. So it, it can sustain itself until the fuel runs out. Once the fuel runs out, it will burn out, obviously. Okay? That is many, many, many million years down the road, though, for us. Uh, but the idea, again, is that it's lowering its internal energy level. What kind of radiation do humans emit? Thermal. It is, it is thermal in general, yeah, but what, on, the, on, the radiation, on the radioactive scale, on the radiation scale. Gamma. Not gamma. Infrared. Infrared, very good. Infrared. Okay? Infrared waves. That's why when you use those like goggles where you can see the infrared goggles, you see like, if you saw like, imagine like a person's body, it'd be like very red yeah. inside the body, maybe like a greenish, orangish, then blue toward the outside. Okay, you see the temperature gradients. Infrared photography. Yeah, infrared photography in general. Look outside in the hallway, in the film studies, you see a lot of that. Okay, a lot of the people decide to take those because they look cool, you know. Macs have that on them, right, don't they? Like MacBook Pros. 
if you use the camera, isn't there like an infrared one which scans? Oh, yeah. I doubt it's real, but it's, it's imitating that yeah. idea. Okay. The iPad has some other things on it. I don't know if it has that. Maybe it does. Okay. So the idea of radiation again is that it's giving off energy through waves, not through direct contact like conduction, or not through fluid flow like convection. But you need to remember the following, people. Everything seems to work together. So like a computer, we said, has conduction and convection occurring. It's also radiating some energy as well. So those three modes occur together, but they act very differently. Their formulas are very different. Their magnitudes are very different. Sometimes conduction is a lot more apparent than convection, sometimes vice versa. Sometimes radiation is the thing that provides the most heat transfer. So it depends on the application itself. And on the application itself. I have a question that's kind of off topic. Okay. How does radiation bleach color? How does radiation what? Bleach color. Because I know that like there are flags up on the moon, and now they're white because the sun's radiation has removed the color. Oh, remove color? Like, 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 yeah, no, I, absolutely, like you were saying. Anything left in the sun, the sun yeah. does. So you're saying it must be radiation because there's no convective currents on the moon. Yeah. There's no atmosphere. There's no convection. And it's clearly not conduction. So we're assuming that it's radiation. Is that, yeah. is that the radiation? I don't know, to be honest, why, how it would remove color. Um, like, like, you picture out, like, yeah, it fades over time. Let's look it up. I mean, let me pull up an app real quick, a browser. I really don't know. It's a good question. I thought the sun just like got rid of color anyway. How does radiation? Bleach. Less in color? Should I use bleach? In fact, bleach won't show up. Untensioned. Sure. Yeah, too faint. Uh, or unsaturated color. Does the sun have every kind of radiation possible? Oh, no. Oh, there you go. It says it right there in the first one. UV rays can break down the chemical bonds and thus fade the colors in an object. It is a bleaching effect. Let's let's click to see more about this. <laughs> Photo degradation. All right, let's read. So it says there are light absorbing color bodies called chromophores that are present in dyes. The colors we see are based upon these chemical bonds and the amount of light that absorbed in a particular wavelength. UV rays can break it down, we just said that. Some objects may, are more prone to fading, such as dyed textiles and watercolors. Others reflect light more, which make them less prone. The chemistry of fading. I can't believe there's a website for this. Let's do it. Oh, are you kidding me? We can't go to this site? Says a server with the specified host name cannot be found. I'll pause and go to my browser.